Hello everyone, it's Carrie Fridley, and today I'm going to talk to you about the history of traditional mountain music in Asheville, North Carolina, and specifically how it relates to the classical music timeline that we study in music appreciation class. Let's take a look at the first settlers in the mountains. Now, of course, in Asheville, this area was Cherokee land for many years. The first Europeans came to the coast of North Carolina, and it, it was Virginia then, I think. Uh, they called it Virginia back in the first settlements were in the early 1700s and in Virginia 1600s. So these would be the people that some of them will migrate west. And we are concerned with them because we are thinking what songs and music musical traditions did they bring when they came? So if we look at the 1600s and 1700s, that is Baroque and classical times. And if you think uh, some of these people will be carrying the social traditions of generations before them, they might bring songs and musical traditions that date all the way back to Renaissance and Middle Ages. And in fact, I can tell you that that's true because they've researched the songs that people sing in their families and have found some that go all the way back to medieval times. So we have the European settlers that come, but also uh, in the farming communities, the agricultural communities, which would have been on the coast and in the Piedmont mainly, these people use slaves uh, on the big plantations and those slaves over hundreds of years developed their style of music which is influenced by the European colonists but also from West Africa so this is where we get the banjo banjo is from Africa and we also get complex percussive rhythms, call and response songs, and different dance forms. So this is as big a part of the traditional music in the mountains as the European influence. Now, there weren't as many slaves in the mountains, but after the slaves were freed, some elected to move here, and they brought their traditions with them. So here are some images uh, that can show us more about the history of traditional music along the way, and we're going to look at them in more detail. This painting is from colonial times and it is from the Caribbean, I believe it's from Haiti. So there's uh, a few paintings from the islands that show slave life. Of course, it's through 
from the perspective of the European slave owners. But if you look over on the right, well, we've got a dance scene going on. And you see the banjo. It's carved out of a gourd. And the neck would have been carved from wood and pegs, friction pegs holding the strings. The strings would be from some sort of entrails. Now, uh, I think calf gut is preferred if you're going to use actual intestines, but they would have used cat intestines. And then there would be a skin head, like a drum on the, the white part down near his strumming hand. And that would have been from a cow hide or around here it'd be a groundhog hide. You see the jugs on the ground, they are instruments too. The jug is kind of like a kazoo. The pitch comes from your body, from your voice. And then you use the jug as an amplifier. You buzz across the top of the jug like you're playing a trombone. <clears throat> and you sing behind it. And it works well for bass notes. I'm not going to try to do that. <laughs> So, uh, and then you see a drum and sticks, percussion, and this type of music is what you would have heard in the slave communities on the islands. Now, the island slaves were traded with the American slaves, so they would have brought their music to the southern United States as well. We don't have very many pictures from paintings from the southern United States slaves. This painting is a later painting and it's looking back at the old days. So this is from the artist is painting this in the 1800s. And here it shows the melding of cultures. We've got the African-American boy playing the sticks on the side of the barn, and then we've got the European dance going on. And you see the violin, but played in this respect, it as a folk instrument, it's known as the fiddle. So this is social music. It's not written down not classical music. It is music for dancing and just for entertainment, played by ear, often using patterns, making it easier to remember. But this, this is the roots of the traditional music in the mountains where we are in Asheville. Here's a European family from the 1700s, and she has her mandolin. So a mandolin in traditional music was more popular in the early days than the guitar. The guitar didn't become popular till the 1900s, really, for folk music and traditional music. So uh, this woman probably sang songs and accompanied herself on the mandolin. She could have purchased music 
at the store broadsides sheet music to learn popular songs or she may just have learned them by ear and accompanied herself singing the songs she knew or the songs that people wanted her to sing for entertainment or maybe to entertain her little girl. So one of the places where you would find this traditional music was at the tavern. And this is a painting of a tavern scene in the Netherlands. So it's in Europe. But this would have been the tradition that has been brought over. Uh, a tavern is a community drinking spot. And you see uh, in the front here, you have a bagpipe player, a violinist, a flutist, uh, and a very happy man sitting on the floor there. And there's uh, a lot going on in the scene. But this would have been one of the places where people would have listened to each other's songs, wanted to learn each other's songs, or using music to uplift your mood, change your mood, or help pass the time, make it easier to... Uh, hang out with your friends, just like today. But this would have been the music that wasn't learned in class or from classical music teachers. This would have been the music that's passed down in the community, not written down, just passed down by ear. So settlers in Asheville, uh, in addition to the Cherokee who are already here, uh, the settlers brought music from the Renaissance, Baroque, and Classical period, or they actually came here during the Renaissance, Baroque, and Classical period, because there's music from medieval times here too. So I'm just going to read this short history about when settlers started entering the Asheville area. Before the arrival of the Europeans, the land where Asheville now exists lay within the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. In 1540, Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto came to the area bringing the first European visitors, along with European diseases, which seriously depleted the native population. The area was used as an open hunting ground until the middle of the 19th century. As early as the 1730s, Ulster Scots, that is, Scots who had lived for a time in Northern Ireland, began making their way southward from Pennsylvania, and their numbers increased in the following decades. Descendants of German families used the same route to locate good lands in the Piedmont, particularly along the Yadkin River. By the end of colonial Governor Arthur Dobbs' term, 1764, North Carolina's estimated population of 130,000 was scattered as far as the Blue Ridge. So the Blue Ridge Mountains, think the Blue Ridge Parkway. So that is us. And I will mention here that Asheville was incorporated as a city 
in 1791. So there were people around here in 1764, but Asheville as a city became incorporated in 1791. So we're going to look at two different types. The two, you can divide traditional music into these two groups. Instrument music and song music. So the social music passed down by ear through generations around Asheville can be divided into traditional instrumental music. Some instruments used would be the fiddle, the mandolin, and the banjo, and also early traditional songs. The songs are separated into two groups, gospel songs and love songs. Gospel songs, songs for church and God, and love songs, songs about people, not about church or God. And that's what the mountain people called them. Because some highly religious folks would say, I don't sing love songs. I only sing gospel songs. So, where do we find the medieval and renaissance social music influences in the ballads, the tavern music, and the dance music. So where we live now is known as a special area for ballads that have early origins from the European settlers coming from Europe. So what is a ballad? Where do they come from? A ballad is a form of verse, often a narrative set to music, so telling a story. Ballads derive from the medieval French chanson, balladier, or ballade, which were originally danced songs. Ballads were particularly characteristic of the popular poetry and song of the British Isles from the later medieval period until the 19th century. They were widely used across Europe and later in Australia, North Africa, North America, and South America. Many ballads were written and sold as single sheet broadsides the form was often used by poets and composers from the 18th century onwards to produce lyrical ballads. In the later 19th century, the term took on the meaning of a slow form of particular love song and is now often used for any love song, particularly the sentimental ballad of pop or rock. In music appreciation class, we talk about medieval and renaissance ballads and the troubadours and trouvères and how this was a popular art form where the noblemen at court would hire musicians to help them write these songs and perform them, and they would entertain each other. And so this is related to the ballad tradition and just the popular tradition of singing songs for each other to entertain each other with stories. So this video about Eleanor of Aquitaine is all about 
the origins of this practice. Her grandfather was one of the first troubadours and Travers from France. And she used music at court as a way of introducing culture and uh, helping um, elevate the status of women at court through music. So you might enjoy watching this video. I will post the slides below. And if you want to check out more about Eleanor of Aquitaine, Aquitaine, check out this video. So there's a fascinating history about the ballads in Madison County, North Carolina. So if you look on this map, you'll see that Madison is right next to Buncombe County, and that's where Asheville is in Buncombe County. So these are our neighbors that are live deeper in the wilderness. And because these mountain communities uh, used to be very isolated, the roads didn't go in there. So uh, they had their own culture and their, their own communities and they kept these songs part of how they lived and that's how they've survived. So there is a historical marker about the ballads and it says English folklorist Cecil Sharp in 1916 collected ballads in the Laurel country. Jane Gentry who supplied many of the songs lived here and that's at a house in hot springs. So uh, the ballads had survived there for hundreds of years. And in 1916, a ballad collector from England came and he found more ballads in uh, Madison County than anywhere else. The Wallen family. Now, this extensive family uh, is mostly responsible for keeping the singing of the ballads alive. It's an interesting story. The Wallen family is an American family of traditional ballad singers from Madison County, North Carolina. Their repertoire of the Appalachian folk ballads many of which were rooted in old world ballads traceable to the British Isles, brought them to the attention of folk music enthusiasts during the American folk music revival of the 1960s. Wallen family members have recorded numerous times over a period of nearly four decades and have appeared in several independent documentaries. So, here is the long list of the family tree of the Wallen family. And um, they are either descendants or married to descendants of Hugh Wallen, who lived from 1829 to 1864. So it sounds like these ballads would have been part of the popular ballads from the British Isles uh, that came to America in the 1800s. Now there's another chapter of the story that cannot be left out the Shelton Laurel Massacre. Now the Laurels are different areas in Madison County. Uh, so there's Shelton Laurel, there's Sodom Laurel, there's Big Laurel. And in 1863, 13 men and boys 
suspected of unionism, were killed by Confederate soldiers. Uh, now, I've heard Anilo Phillips tell this story, and his music is featured at the end of this presentation. He says the, the boys back in the mountains didn't hardly even know anything about the Civil War. They were so isolated. And the Confederate Army came through and took their food that they had stored up for winter to use for the Army. And they needed that food to get through the winter. So the men went and stole the food back. And the Confederate soldiers killed them and left all the women to get through the winter without their men and without any food. And this changed the history from then on. They, the women in the laurels very distrustful of outsiders. The women that survived are very strong and the ballads they sing are about strong women and also about the lookout for, you know, trust your intuition. There is evil around that you should be scared of and worried about. And that's the subject matter of their ballots. It's just an interesting turn of events for the musical transmission line. So this is Kaz Wallen. And he made several recordings for folklorists during his life. His ballad that I've chosen for you to listen to, if you choose to, is Pretty Saro. He's the father of Doug and Jack Wallen. Next is Berzilla Wallen. Her ballads, she has others recorded other than these, but The House Carpenter, O oh Death, and My Love Has Brought Me to Despair are some of her famous ballads. This is Doug and Jack Wallen, the brothers. And they have a whole CD that's on Smithsonian Folkways, if you want to listen to their songs. But here's a link to their song, The Golden Vanity, if you want to find this in the slides and give them a listen. Deli Norton, known as Granny. Her grandchildren and great-grandchildren today learn their songs from Deli Norton. Here's a picture of her when she's younger. Looks like they've been fishing. If you want to listen to one of her songs, you might like My Love Has Brought Me to Despair or Silk Merchant's Daughter. This is Sheila K. Adams, recipient of the National Folk Heritage Award, awarded to her at the White House 
She is the granddaughter of Deli Norton. And this link will take you to the ballad Little Margaret. This is one of the ballads that has been dated back to medieval times because there's a line in the text about how they buried the woman with her face turned towards the wall because she had committed suicide. And that was a medieval practice. So listen to little Margaret if you dare. Instrumental dance and social music. These paintings are from the classical era. These are slave musicians from the Caribbean. So on the left, you see a banjo player. The banjo has a skin head on it. Friction pegs holding the strings. There's little pieces of bone. And it looks like This banjo is pretty nice. It has metal pieces. You would have to get the blacksmith to make you these brackets to hold the drum tight and also a metal tail piece. And as I mentioned, the strings would have been some sort of intestines. And on the right, a fiddler playing the violin. The difference between a violin and a fiddle, it's pretty much uh, the style of music you play on it. The instrument is the same. Sometimes a fiddle will flatten their bridge so they can play two strings at once. Um, so that bridge looks like it's kind of flat, actually, when I look at it. But these are some beautiful paintings and you can see the instruments and how uh, they would have been played during the 1700s. So here is a famous fiddler from the mountains, Samantha Bumgarner from Dillsboro, North Carolina, which is less than an hour away from Asheville. It's near Silva. And Samantha Bumgarner was a famous recording sensation, radio sensation, and she played the mountain tunes she learned from her ancestors in the mountains. Aunt Samantha Bumgarner and her friend Eva Davis were music partners from Dillsboro, North Carolina in the 1920s. Samantha played fiddle and Eva played the banjo. In 1924, they traveled to New York City to record 12 songs for Columbia Records making them the first female country solo recording artists in history. In 1939, the musical duo represented mountain music at the White House in Washington, D.C., when they played for President Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the King and Queen of England. Big Eyed Rabbit is a popular song from that first recording session. So if you'd like to hear Samantha, click on Big Eyed Rabbit and hear her fiddling. Here's a famous picture of Aunt Samantha Bumgarner 
and Fiddlin' Bill Hensley. Bascom Lamar Lunsford from Mars Hill, North Carolina. He was born in 1882. He learned to play the banjo and violin at a young age, and his mother taught him to sing church songs and folk songs. As an adult, he became a song collector and performer and shared over 500 songs with the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. from the mountain singers around Mars Hill. One of his popular songs is, I Wish I Was a Mole in the Ground. So click on Bascom, one of our hometown heroes, to hear him sing, I Wish I Was a Mole in the Ground. Marcus Martin came from Macon County, but he moved to Buncombe County and brought his lifetime of fiddling to share with our community here. Best remembered for his masterful fiddling, Martin was a multi-instrumentalist playing the banjo, harmonica, and dulcimer. He was also an accomplished traditional ballad singer. He learned much of his repertoire and technique from his father, Rowan Martin, a fiddler, who he, re he reminisced in later years could play the sweetest you ever heard. Martin grew up in a farming family, but over the years he tried his hand at many different professions. When he was a young man, he worked for a dry goods company, filed saws for loggers, and was the postmaster of the community of Rodo. In later life, he worked in the laundry at a textile mill in Gastonia and as a clerk and then watchman at the Beacon Mill in Swannanoa. In his youth, Martin often played unaccompanied for square dances in Macon and Cherokee counties. A favorite fiddler of Bascom Lamar Lunsford, Martin played for many years at Lunsford's Mountain Dance and Folk Festival in Asheville, opening the festival with the tune Gray Eagle. Martin is a source for unusual tunes that are played by old time fiddlers today, including Lady Hamilton and Jenny Runaway in the Mud in the Night. Click on Marcus Martin to hear the Gray Eagle. So there are descendants of these musicians and also musicians in the communities that still play the old style of traditional music. And two of the ballad singers are Donna Ray Norton and Melanie Adams. Melanie Adams' mother is Sheila K. Adams who I mentioned had the National Folk Heritage Award. And so they are both direct descendants of the Wallen family ballad singers. Travis Stewart is an incredible traditional banjo player from Canton, North Carolina, just over the mountain from us. And he plays the traditional styles similar to how Samantha Baumgartner played. And he specializes in the traditional songs of Haywood County and also Asheville and Madison County. He can play all the old tunes. Arvel Freeman from Maggie Valley, North Carolina. Fiddler extraordinaire. 
nationally acclaimed recording artist. artist. He was the leader of the host band of the downtown Shindig on the Green, the traditional music gathering that happens in the summer on the public square in Asheville. And he can play old time tunes, square dance tunes, also more modern bluegrass styles. Just an incredible musician and wealth of knowledge. Annalo Phillips, ballad singer from Mars Hill, North Carolina. Annalo came to AB Tech and sang ballads for the music appreciation class. And you can watch a video of that performance here. He is from the Laurel community area. And he knows the old ballads, and he is related by marriage to the Wallen family descendants.
sky, Lord, in the sky. Undertaker, 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 please drive slow. For this lady, you are holy. Lord, I hate to see her go. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord. I follow close behind her, trying to hold up and be brave. But I could not hide my sorrow. When they laid her in the grave, will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by, there's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. I went back home, my home was lonely since my mother she. My little brothers and sisters are crying for the home so sad and alone. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky. The Junior Appalachian Musicians. Now, in the early days before electricity, there was more incentive for the young people to learn how to play instruments uh, because they would be participating in the music making and the, the community involvement, um, entertaining and dancing and uh, being part of the group that knew all the songs. But these days, now that we have TV and Internet, there's just not as much call for family entertainment. So in came the Junior Appalachian Mus Musicians Program. They offer lessons after school in the mountain counties uh, all through the Southern Appalachian Mountains in Virginia and uh, in North Carolina and in Georgia. And if you have a young person who's interested in this kind of music, check out the Junior Appalachian Musicians website. I am personally involved with three of the jams around here, the Madison County Jam, Buncombe County, which meets in, Mad in Black Mountain, and the Haywood County Jam, which meets in Canton, North Carolina. And this concludes our video about traditional music in Western North Carolina. I hope you'll check out some of the recordings that I've listed for you. And thank you for taking an interest in traditional mountain music. <laughs>